Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. It's your friendly narrator, Sue, here. And I just like to say, when I was younger, my favorite times would be when my family would gather together. I would go and play with my cousins while the adults sat and talked. But once it started getting dark out, something magical happened. We lit candles and everybody came together the children, the adults, the elders, and we began to share in that candlelight our stories, stories of the paranormal, scary things that had happened to us, family lore, encounters with monsters, all sorts of spooky things. And these were my favorite times as a kid. So allow me to light the candles and invite you wherever you may be into my living room for the next hour, your family. So please, sit, listen, enjoy. Grab a snack, grab a drink, get cozy. As I share with you some terrifying stories, some heartwarming encounters, but most of all, every tale I tell is thought-provoking. Here we indulge in tales of Bigfoot, Dogman, and a whole host of other paranormal entities. So get cozy, cuz here we go. I'm going to be honest, people won't like what I have to say, but it's the truth. I'm a snitch. Since I was a kid, and now as a man in my 20s, I will tell on anyone to save my own skin. I did whatever was necessary to survive when I started hustling. Now, I know what you're thinking. What does this have to do with monsters? Just wait, I'm getting there. Let me make something clear. Just because I'm a snitch doesn't mean I'll betray my friends, but I sure as heck will turn on my enemies. And that's how I ended up in the predicament I'm about to share with you. There was this guy called Ra. He was in control of a sizable operation in my area, and people feared him. It was well-earned respect and fear because he was truly dangerous. But I wanted what he had, and I couldn't take it with muscle, so I waited. One day, Ra and his wife fought. He beat the life out of her. No one intervened because everyone, including the girl's father, was terrified of him. So I called the police. He was on parole, and domestic violence was violation of that parole. They came and picked him up. Where things went wrong was that I assumed he didn't have the money for a fancy lawyer, but it turned out he did. So he's gone, and I'm expecting him to sit for at least 60 months. I moved in and took over his operation, set up shop. An aggressive takeover was in the works. Six months passed. We were going about our business when, unbeknownst to me, they let this guy out. That's when things took a turn for the worse. I pulled up on the street and noticed it was really quiet. Then, out of nowhere, it felt like five people started shooting at me. Miraculously, I didn't get hit. I drove away, and these boys followed me in their car, chasing me around town like I was in the movie Lethal Weapon. So, I drove straight to the police station. When I pulled up, the cops looked at me like, what the heck? The guys chasing me sped away, and I went inside to tell on them once more. But what I didn't know was that Ra had made some new friends. Those friends just so happened to be the police. I was in the room when these two cops came in and said, Yeah, you like to snitch, but you want to sell dope. Nobody, not even us, respects that. They refused to let me press charges and then let me go. Imagine the scene. I walked outside to my shot-up car, thinking, what the heck? Fast forward, my life became a nightmare. The only safe place for me was in the woods. I'd been out there for about a week, hiding in a little cabin my uncle owned. The first time I saw one of these things, it scared me so much, I started shooting at it. I thought it was one of the boys coming to kill me. But then everything started shaking around me. And I was like, come on, I just can't win. So I was there 
in the cabin, trying to figure out what to do, scared out of my mind, people wanting to kill me, and something shaking the entire cabin. Then something looked in the window, and it was a Bigfoot. I couldn't believe what I saw outside the cabin's window. A creature that looked like a Bigfoot, with a head as big as the window, and a menacing expression. I felt like leaving, but I couldn't risk it because the boys who were after me would kill me if they found me. The creature's size suggested that it could easily break the wall and kill me. So I just sat there and waited for it to leave. It was a terrifying sight, but eventually it left. I had no food or water, and my car was in a terrible state with bullet holes and leaks. All I had in the car were some gummy bears and bubble gum, which wasn't good for my empty stomach. I had to walk two miles to a gas station to get some food. The creature was there every time I walked, making it the most terrifying walk I've ever taken. When I got to the gas station, I bought lots of water, chips, canned food, and Snickers, and the girl behind the counter told me that people were looking for me, including the cop. I knew the two cops who were looking for me, so I had to be careful. When I walked back to the woods, I could hear the creature sniffing. I decided to feed it with some raw hot dogs, hoping it would leave me alone. For a mile, it was quiet, but then the creature came back with friends. I couldn't let them take my food, so I kept it moving. Luckily, those hot dogs seemed to hold them over as I headed back to the cabin. Fast forward a bit. I ended up staying in the woods for two weeks, living off snacks and feeling sick as a dog. When one morning it started raining, dark skies, thunder rumbling, lightning flashing, and I heard a car coming up the road in the woods. I thought, okay, this is it. They found me. They're coming to kill me. So I grabbed my things and took off. Imagine the scene. I head out the back door of the cabin with my rifle in hand and into the woods. It's cold, wet, water is running down my face as I hid on the ground in the foliage. An unmarked police car pulled up. The two plainclothes cops got out, guns drawn, kicked the front door to the cabin and go inside, started searching the place. Now, if that's not enough to deal with now, my heart is racing, and I felt something moving my backpack, but I thought it was just sliding because of the rain. When I turn around, I saw one of those Bigfoot eating chocolate bars out of my backpack, wrapper and all. It was down on one knee, head the size of my chest, just eating and staring at the cabin. Have you ever been so terrified that you could hear your heart beat in your ears? Well, that's how it felt. It was like this thing didn't fear me at all. They started to thrash around in the cabin, and it stood up, took one giant step, and disappeared back into the woods. The police left a few minutes later, and I emerged from the woods once they were up the road. As I headed toward the back door of the cabin, I heard what sounded like a bunch of trees falling, followed by the sound of a car speeding away. I spent a few more days in the woods before returning to the gas station. The guy working there asked me where I had been. And he told me that Ra and his entire crew had been murdered by some Louisianans. It was in the newspaper. Hands me a copy of the paper. And I say, I don't know where you've been hiding, but smells like you've been in a garbage dump. So I went back into the woods with my food. The Bigfoots trailed me the entire walk. Never did anything aggressive. Besides, I bought huge bags of nuts for them, tossing them in the woods as I walked. Picture this. When I returned to the cabin, I found the same two officers there. This is where feeding the Bigfoot come in handy. Remember, the big one that was eating out of my backpack? He didn't like they were there. Not at all. He came tearing through the woods, whooping and yelling in a sound that I had never heard and never wanted to hear again. It sounded like a chimpanzee enclosure at the zoo. I hid in the trees, thinking, okay, Y'all police gonna get the heck out of here now? And that is when I was pushed. Not quite thrown, but my feet left the ground, and I stumbled forward right out into the open. The officers looked at me, then at the woods, then at me again, and then at the woods. 
That's when one of them said, you're under arrest, pointed his gun at me, and everything went bananas. Trees started shaking and breaking. Rocks were thrown at their cars. And one of them said, man, what is going on here? As they both turned, hopping in and drove off. Let me stop right here and tell you this. I stayed in that cabin for an entire year, and I saw them all the time. When the food was cooked outside, they came, and some of it went, so I always bought a lot. It was the most peaceful time in my life. When I left the cabin, I was a changed man. I realized there was more to life than what I had seen, and I decided to travel and get away. So I got on a bus and left. Two years later, I returned to that same cabin. It was quiet. My old car was still parked out front, and I didn't see them, but I had the impression they were there, watching. On to the next one. It happened on a snowy night. My parents had called me and told me they would be home late. The highway was blocked. It was a Friday night, and I was alone. I was watching TV, eating a microwave pizza. I was looking for something interesting to watch, and I was switching channels. At around 9 p.m., when I heard a thud, like something hitting the wall outside the house by the kitchen, I went to look, but the snow was falling so hard. It was dark, so I couldn't see much. Across the street, a streetlight was illuminating a portion of the darkness. It was making the snowflakes visible and I could see them falling on the ground in silence. I remained for several seconds by the window to look at it, but then someone went walking by and stopped right under the streetlight. It was a man, tall and skinny, very emaciated. He was dressed entirely in black, and I could not see his face under his hat. He was standing in silence under the streetlight. I could see the snow falling on his shoulders. There was something unhealthy about this man. I was feeling uneasy just by looking at him without really understanding why. It seemed he was staring back at me from across the street. He stood there for a moment and then motioned at me, inviting me to join him outside. I closed the curtain as fast as I could and went back to the living room not without checking that all the doors and windows were locked. It took me a few minutes to calm down, and I went back to the television to think about something else. I was back at switching channels, looking for something to watch. One channel after another, until I came across a channel that I could not help but watch. There was something strange about it. It was a still shot, filming a street under the snow. You couldn't see much. In a glance, you could have thought it was just noise on the screen, like when a television is plugged in between two channels. But after a few seconds, the camera moved. The camera stopped filming the street and turned toward a street lamp. But not just any street lamp. The lamp post under which the man I just saw was standing. The man was staring at the camera without saying anything. He was just waving at it. Then he raised his hand again and pointed at something behind the camera. The camera turned slowly around and filmed the house across the street. My house. It felt like my heart stopped. I rushed to the television to turn it off and ran to my room. My parents, when they came, found me hiding under the sheet, white as snow. I tried to explain. But they obviously didn't believe me. They said it was a bad dream, and maybe it was. But when the snow is falling heavily during a snowstorm, and I see a street light, I wonder still about the tall man I saw back then when I was just a kid. On to the next one.
near Alamuchi in Warren County in New Jersey. It was on Waterloo Road near the Sussex-Warren County border. I had missed my ride home from Hackettstown, New Jersey to Byram, New Jersey. The road to get back to Byram is Waterloo Road. It was about 9.30 to 10 p.m., so I decided to hitchhike it on the Waterloo, hoping that someone would give me a lift back to Highway 206. It was very dark, and as I was walking past Stephen State Park and then Old Saxon Falls area, I could hear something that sounded like it was on two feet stalking me in the woods on the ridge side of Waterloo Road. It got very interesting when I started sprinting. It also started sprinting, keeping up with me for what seemed like at least a mile. When I would walk, it would walk. It was loud as it went through the woods, as I stayed on the road, hoping for a car to pick me up. Eventually, I did get a ride near a few houses after passing an old tavern on the river side of Waterloo Road. I noticed that I was being stalked by something on two feet as I walked and ran on Waterloo Road. It was very dark, so I was unable to see anything, but my adrenaline from the fear I sensed was very high. It was 10 p.m., very dark, bright stars, not much moonlight. There was a river on one side of the road, ridge, hills, woodlands on the other side, very near Waterloo Village. On to the next one. A large, hairy beast grabbed the door of a woman's car and ran alongside it at up to 60 miles per hour. This was in Penn's Grove in Salem County in New Jersey. On to the next one. Dale English, a Chatsworth teenager, was ice skating with a friend when they detected a repulsive odor like a dead fish. Soon, they saw two big red eyes that belonged to a seven-foot-tall creature. The two teens ran to get their families, but by the time they had returned, the creature was gone. Chatsworth is in Burlington County in New Jersey. On to the next one. Two experienced female campers who were illegally camping on the abandoned railroad tracks in Addison in Burlington County complained to park rangers that screams as well as violent thrashing in the bushes around them kept them awake. They sent their large dog out into the Pine Barrens, but it rapidly retreated back to their tent. The two women then fled to the safety of an all-night diner in Hamilton. Around the same time, Real estate agents had trouble selling or even leasing a house south of Manahawking in Ocean County, New Jersey, as several prospective buyers and sellers backed out of deals after seeing a large monster with glowing red eyes. On to the next one. The Paiute. They lived throughout a broad range but in no limited way to California, Nevada, Idaho, Utah, and even some of Oregon. There is more than one band or division of Paiute First Nations. As with many other Native American tribes, there also appears to be many stories of what seems to be Bigfoot, Sasquatch, spread out among the different divisions of this tribe. One such story is in the 1883 book written by Sarah Winnemucha titled Life Among the Paiutes, which is also the first book ever written by a First Nations woman, tells some of the strange lore of the cannibalistic red-haired giants of Nevada, which the Paiute referred to as Sitikaz in her book Winnemuchas describes some of the terrifying strategies of these cannibalistic giants. As she notes, they would dig large holes in our trails at night, and if any of our people traveled at night, which they did, for they were afraid of these barbarous people, they would oftentimes fall into these holes. Another disturbing detail is given to these giants 
as they were also described to dig up Paiute bodies, which they would then in turn eat as food, as Winnemucha would write, and then confirm rather seriously in detail for a second time in the book. Yes, they would even come and dig up our dead after they were buried, and would carry them off and eat them. The Sitikas were described as being very warlike toward the Paiute. At one point, the Paiute would find their cave and set wood inside, which they would then burn with fire. At the point in the story where the wood was being placed inside the caves, the Sitikas, Winnemucha notes, the poor fools began to put the wood inside till the cave was full. The above indicates that these creatures did not have any idea of fire, which is obviously why the wood had been placed into the cave to begin with. This is a similarity shared with other primates aside from humans, which may take objects that are handed to them out of curiosity. The story in Winnemucha's book then relates that the Paiutes had tried to yell in the cave for the animals to stop eating people like beasts. Yet there was no reply. It was at that point that the wood inside the cave had been set on fire, and these creatures had died from being burned, and from being asphyxiated by the smoke from inside the cave. Life Among the Paiutes was written almost thirty years before the beginning of a great find at a local location known as Lovelock Cave. This appears to be the same cave that was described to be where these creatures had died, according to Winnemucha's book. It was at that location where the discovery of several giant humanoid skeletons had later been unearthed. As told in the David Hatcher Childress book, Yetis, Sasquatch, and Hairy Giants. At first, thirteen skeletons had been excavated by scientists from the University of California at Berkeley. Then, thirty-two more skeletons had been unearthed, according to Childress in the book, as quoted. In systematic excavations, the cave was found to contain the remains of twelve more bodies, making the total of bodies recovered from the cave almost sixty. This would seem to positively verify the Paiute legends of the Sitikas, who, as suggested from Winnemucha's book, had been asphyxiated in a cave with smoke from burning wood. This is yet another classic example of an old Indian legend leading to an actual discovery. Some among the Owens Valley Paiutes refer to this creature as Ninumik. In Julian H. Stewart's 1936 book title, Myths of the Owens Valley Paiute, Nunamik is described as a giant and enemy of the Indians. Nunamik has the ability to travel great distances in a short amount of time. This is because of what the book relates as this creature's big strides or length between each footstep. Even today, this observation is still common among scientists who study the big footprints and very long strides between them. In the book, Nunamik reportedly also killed people by looking at them. In Ivan T. Sanderson's 1961 classic book, Abominable Snowman Legend Come to Life, there is a description of a giant Bigfoot or Sasquatch-like creature in Africa which natives to the region describe as having the ability to do the very same thing, actually killing people by looking at them. From an article written by Isabella T. Kelly in 1938 titled Northern Paiute Tales in the October to December 1938 edition of the Journal of American Folklore, a very large cannibal kind of man called Nu Muzoho is described as the author is quoted in the article on the expedition of these finds, the investigation took place during the summer of 1930 and was financed by the Department of Anthropology, University of California, and the Bureau of American Ethnology. From the first story in the article titled, The Creation of the Indians, Numuzoho is described to have risen sometime after a great flood had covered the mountains. 
as the story mentions some kind of man happened after the water dried he was called numuzoho cannibal numu meaning people paiute zoho pound he was a big man who ate other men numuzoho has a very strong stature which is described as actually scaring people to death the story says this of Numizoho's strong stare as it relates to people. He killed them just by looking at them. The story then mentions how regular people, as we know them, were created and then almost completely killed off by Numuzoho. Those who survived and lived on to become the Paiute Indians, as the story says, they were the only Indians living. The rest were all killed by those cannibals. In another variant of the same story with the same name, Numuzoho is challenged to a game in which he is fooled into losing. He is then hit with a big stick, as the story then mentions, the cannibal was dying. He kicked around and made all these mountains. In a story titled Numuzoho Plays Ball, Numuzohos play ball and loses to the other animals. After the Numuzoho loses the game, they are killed and their teeth are cleaned of all the other animals they had eaten, which are then given new life. In another variant of the same described story, Numuzoho is challenged to another game. The game is to be played on Numuzoho's schedule and in his home territory. It was night, and they were going to play over the mountain. A gopher is then instructed by the other animals to rig the game against Numuzoho by digging holes under the soft earth. Since Numuzoho is described as being very large, the idea is that the holes dug under the earth would not be able to withstand the pressure of his tremendous weight. He might even break his ankle on the way down. Numuzoho then loses and is thrown into the fire. When they threw him into the fire, he started kicking around. That's what made all these canyons. In a story titled Coyote and Numuzoho, the association of Numuzoho pushing people over cliffs while hunting for mountain sheep is given, much similar to stories told among the Yakima tribe in relation to hunting mountain goats. Here is more of what the story says of Numuzoho on a rim rock who wait to push people off cliffs. Numuzoho stood there and called to anyone who happened to come along. When they were close to him, he pushed them over the cliff. He told them there were mountain sheep below. He killed those people every time. In this story, Numuzoho is fooled again by being lured into a camp which was made to look abandoned. Good idea, as is noted of the man who set the trap. He made the camp look as though it had been left for a long time. This brings in Numuzoho, who is fooled and then killed when he is asked to face in the opposite direction, possibly so he wouldn't kill his opponent with a strong stare. As Numuzoho faces the other way, he is repeatedly hit by his opponent, who also exclaims, You killed my brothers and my sisters and my relative. In another variant of the same story, Numuzoho is asked after he is defeated, What did you do with all my cousins? Why did you carry this kind of stone around? In the same story, another Numuzoho is killed by his opponent who runs under Numuzoho's legs in the opposite direction when it attempts to push him over the edge of a cliff. As the story notes, he slipped under the man's legs and that fellow himself went over. Coyote looked down below and saw lots of bones there. He'd killed lots of men that fellow had. In a story titled Some Adventures of Coyote, Numuzoho is again fooled and killed by Coyote. Before he dies, Numuzoho wishes death to Coyote, who all of a sudden finds himself inside of a giant's cannibal stomach with mostly just the bones of others who'd also been eaten. After seeing light from above, and then, setting a fire under the giant's heart, the story mentions, Coyote picked up all the bones and piled them in one place. He made them into persons again. He killed everyone who was a cannibal. From a story, Cottontail Shoots the Sun, Numuzoho is once again associated with whistling noises. 
another band of Paiute First Nations, which live near the reaches of Yosemite in California, are known as the Mono Lake Paiute. Among other Mono Lake Paiute legends, which may pertain to Bigfoot and Sasquatch, there are those of Mogul Numa, or Granite People, as it translates to in English. Mogul Numa meant Granite People because we believed the Granite Spires were living beings. Did the Mogul Numa Granite People cure their fur with resins and saps from trees, and then roll and wallow around in sand until they appear to be wearing a stone coat? As is also suggested by Eastern tribes, such as the Iroquois, Cree, Cherokee, and Pemsicott tribe, this stone coat would probably be a better defense at withstanding arrows or bullets for that matter, and might give the Mogul Numa the excellent ability to blend in to their environment. The monolith Paiute legend of the Granite People bears a likeness of similarity to Eastern Native American accounts of the stone coat or stone giant. Yet, the granite people among the Paiute, we get similar descriptions from a tribe on the other side of the country. How can that be? Mentioned from the same article, there are old stories of Bigfoot Sasquatch-like creatures referred to as Pahizohos, which were also told by the Mono Lake Paiute. The Yosemite area tribes all recognize Bigfoot as something different from any other creature, including bears. The Paiute Indian and the Pahizohos would avoid one another out of a mutual respect. However, it is also mentioned that children away from the group were being eaten by Pahizohos. The First Nations assumed that the life of the creatures must be very difficult, but became even more concerned, believing that if Pahizohos were eating children, they would also begin hunting older people for food as well. It was right before the arrival of John C. Fremont that the Mono Lake Paiute Indians had found the cave home of the Pahizohos. They then affixed a large amount of sagebrush in front of the caves, which they had then set on fire. This supposedly killed the creatures from being burned, as well as from being asphyxiated with smoke from inside the cave. There are also frequent stories from among the Mono Lake Paiute of Bigfoot Sasquatch being seen as an abductor of people, and an old story of a Paiute woman who was abducted in the bush by a creature fitting the same description as the Pai Zoho. The woman claims to have been raped and held captive until the creature was fast asleep. Then the creature released its grip on the woman while sleeping. She made her escape back to her people. At last she was safe with her family, but she began to show signs of pregnancy. All but her closest friends and immediate family members stayed away from the woman while she was pregnant. Nine months later, the woman gave birth to what the story then describes as a big red-headed baby boy who was very hairy. Many in the tribe were very scared at first, and some of the men in the tribe even wanted the baby boy dead. However, he was saved by his mother who was then raised him. Eventually, the rest of the tribe would also decide to accept the child as well. As he grew up, he grew more human, and had developed superb hunting abilities. He had very keen eyesight and a strong sense of smell, not to mention he was very strong. He was a good hunter, and he had uncanny natural abilities of sight and smell and was very strong. He had later married, and his children came out normal. However, it is said that every now and again his descendants come out covered from head to toe with red hair. Many of his descendants are now scattered in many of the Paiute tribes in California and Nevada. On to the next one. In Noxie, Nevada County, Oklahoma. A few miles north of town, Kenneth Tosh and others heard clawing on the screen door of a dilapidated house 20 feet from the Tosh residence. There was a hairy humanoid standing there, watching the witnesses walk over. It then started growling. The creature was seven to eight feet tall, with hair all over its body that was a blackish-brown color and was one and a half to two inches long. There was no hair around its eyes, 
or on its nose, and the reddish pink eyes glowed. When witnesses got to ten feet away, the humanoid ran away, and the witnesses ran in the opposite direction. The creature also had a foul smell. The witnesses thought again four hours later, on top of a barn across the road, and it was seen several times over the next few weeks. There were 24 witnesses in total. Some fired at a hairy humanoid, but to no effect. Jared Bullock and Marion Parrott at different times fired at the hairy humanoid and were sure that they hit it. The hairy humanoid made a sound like a kid screaming or a woman hollering. There were also strange whistles, and the hairy humanoid smelled like dead fish, rotten eggs, sulfur, or wet nappies, also called diapers. Only one footprint was found, and it was eight inches across at the top and two inches across at the heel. The imprint was flat-footed with three toes. Kenneth Tosh's brother-in-law saw two hairy humanoids. One had red eyes, while the other had yellow eyes. They were calling each other from 300 yards apart. The yellow-dyed one was grayer and six inches shorter than the red-eyed one. On to the next one. Anthony Ketchum, Steve Ketchum, and Alan Heron heard something in a fenced farm lot where horses and hogs were kept. Then something jumped out of the bushes in front of their headlight. This something was taller than a man, hairy all over, and looked like a big monkey. The man-beast made a grunting noise and started chasing the witnesses with a hopping motion. On to the next one. Near the mouth of Yashua Creek, near Little River, in McCurtain County, Oklahoma, a hunter saw a hairy humanoid. The creature was eight feet tall, had grayish-black hair, with long arms, and ran off when it became aware of the witness. On to the next one. In Turleton, in Pawnee County, in Oklahoma, Beth Ann Gibson saw a short figure walking on a field parallel to her home. Thinking that it was a lost child, she yelled at it. The figure suddenly turned around, revealing a creature with large, glowing red eyes and long, dangling arms. Soon after this, cattle in the area began to die under mysterious circumstances, and, in some cases, pregnant cows were found strangely mutilated with their amniotic sac inexplicably missing. On to the next one. In Latimer County in Oklahoma, I went with my church, Bethel Baptist, on a retreat to Robbers Cave State Park. We'd arrived on Friday evening and would be leaving on Sunday afternoon. Well, on Saturday, I couldn't shake the feeling that we, the campers, were being watched. Later that afternoon, a storm rolled in, and it was getting pretty strong by the time lights out came. The girl's cabin was located at the far end of the campground and was in the shape of a horseshoe. I was sleeping on the top bunk bed on the right arm. If you were standing at the door in the middle of the three bunk beds for that side, everyone was really nervous because of the storm. So it took a while for us girls to go to sleep. Well, I couldn't go to sleep because I'm really scared of storms. So I was just laying in my sleeping bag when I heard the sound of the screen door to the cabin open. I thought I was hearing things until I heard it bang shut. I told myself it was one of the girls or maybe a counselor going to the bathroom, but then I smelled something foul. At that point, I became very still, hardly breathing, and I could hear heavy shuffling footsteps walking around the cabin on the other side. Then the shuffling started coming my way and the smell increased. I became like a board. The next thing I know, I can feel something standing above and behind me, and I hear this deep breathing and a sort of a soft growl coming from above my head, which I couldn't understand because I was on the top bunk bed. I wanted to scream, 
thought I was too scared. I continued to listen and whatever it was, walked to the window at the foot of the bunk bed, then returned to the head of the bed, standing behind me. What happened next froze the blood in my veins. Something large and furry touched my face. It traced my face and along the headgear I was wearing for my braces. The next thing I remember, I was waking up in the morning on the floor beside the bunk bed, in my sleeping bag, with my pillow under my head. I have no idea how I got there, and it really freaked me out. I thought I had a really bad dream until the girl who had been sleeping in the bunk bed beside me on the bottom grabbed me the next morning and told me she had seen it. I asked her what she had seen, and she said it was a big, black, hairy creature standing behind me, and she couldn't scream because she thought that if she did, it would kill me. She and I made a promise never to tell anyone about what had happened, and I haven't until this day. There was just the feeling that we were being watched all day Saturday. There were two witnesses, myself and the girl that was on the bottom bunk to my right. The environment was very wooded around the cabin and hilly due to the surrounding mountains. On to the next one. My name is Glenn and I live on a small cattle ranch in north central Texas between the two small communities of Graham and Jacksboro, Texas. This is a very remote area with many hundreds of thousands of acres of largely uninhabited ranch land. We have several nearby lakes, including one large one named Possum Kingdom. I grew up in this area, and my memories of youth involved open fields, beautiful sunsets that lasted forever, and scattered groves of ancient oaks with smatterings of mesquite trees here and there. Over the years, farming has stopped, ranchers have moved out, and the mesquite cutting and clearing has all but ceased. The mesquite trees have now become so dense that they actually form a large forest. I don't think anyone or anything ever changed here, but I have been proven wrong once again. The countryside is now lightly populated with rural homes, many seasonal creeks, and lots of cover for wild animals and people. I have spent many years as a park ranger. I absolutely love the outdoors and all the inspiration nature provides. As a side note, I believe that it is from nature that we all get our greatest inspiration and our greatest connection with God. I believe that when we live exclusively in cities and surround ourselves with only man-made ideas and mechanisms, it allows our ego to grow out of control until we think we are the authors of all creation. By immersing ourselves in God's creation, we realize the smallness of ourselves and our ideas. It becomes much easier to gain perspective on ourselves and the world in which we live. When immersed in nature, the cyclical and interdependent nature of all that exists becomes far more observable than it ever could from inside a Volvo during rush hour in downtown Dallas. But I digress. I moved back to this area and to my family's ranch in order to take care of my elderly mother who refused to give up and move to town. I had several changes in my life and it just seemed to be the right time to move to the country. I bought a nice mobile home and had it put down a few hundred yards from my mother's house, so as to preserve each other's space and privacy. Many thousands of dollars later, I wished I had simply bought a travel trailer and put it in the backyard. All that aside, I enjoyed the house, and it worked well being near mother. The only drawback was employment. As I mentioned, we lived in the middle of nowhere, and because of this, work is hard to find. I have previously lived in small cities and rural communities, and for recreation, I would find the most remote areas and go hiking and exploring at every chance I got. I have traveled and hiked over much of the United States, Canada, and Alaska. 
I even majored in recreation and parks in college. After hiking and wilderness camping in Alaska, I thought I knew wilderness. That is, until I actually moved out into the country. I spent the first six months being almost entirely outside, just listening to all the sounds. It was unbelievable to hear the sound of nature without the low roar of traffic in the background, or foreground for that matter. Ever thought about the sounds that deer make? I always thought they were largely silent, as they were when being observed. On the contrary, their huffs, nighttime balls, and sparring are fuel for the imagination. I learned the unique sound of all the birds, frogs, insects, and mammals, both large and small. I can even tell the type of bird just by the sound of its wings flapping overhead. The nightly and sometimes daily calls of the coyote changed markedly with their moods and needs. I remember reading a story as a youth about an Eskimo tribe who knew that three white men were coming only by the calls of the wolves. I thought this preposterous. I now listen to the coyotes telling me if there is someone or something on the ranch and where exactly they are located. If the coyotes don't warn me, the birds do. The deer will also let you know when something is out of place. I find it sad that due to the encroachment of civilization, many of us can't experience the natural world anymore. I never thought Sasquatch lived anywhere but the Pacific Northwest, and I wasn't even certain about that fact. I remember seeing the Patterson-Gimlin film as a child, but did not give it too much thought as it didn't seem relevant to my life in Texas. I became interested in the phenomenon later in life and have been fervently pursuing it for about 15 years. I remember flipping through the channels one night and seeing an episode of Finding Bigfoot. I thought to myself, finally, something worth watching. I have read well over 50 books now, watched hundreds of hours of films and documentaries, and have become the local amateur Sasquatch expert, for whatever that's worth. I frequently wear Sasquatch t-shirts, and it is amazing the stories people will come up with and willingly volunteer. I would like to share a few of these with you, as well as my own experiences. I will keep it narrowed down to the area where I live, as it is definitely not well documented. There is a very remote area in Jack County called Squaw Mountain. It is home to several big game ranchers and a lot of native wildlife. After many casual conversations with a friend of mine at work about Sasquatch, we decided to take his wife and kids out squatching one evening. We decided to head for Squaw Mountain, which we were drawn to both because of our lack of familiarity with the area and its remoteness. We call it dirt roading around here. We all climb in the truck and drive around on remote roads late at night in the hope of seeing wild animals and such. It is really just a fun time to drive around and listen to the night sound, identify a few constellations, get eaten by mosquitoes, and tease the kids. On this particular night, we took a night vision camera and a listening device. As we thought we needed to appear serious about squatching in front of the kids, it never occurred to any of us what would actually transpire. There were four of us in this pickup that night. It is a crew cab, by the way. We had been driving around for a couple of hours and had seen nothing but the usual hogs, coyotes, deer, rabbits, skunks, squirrels, raccoons. You get the picture. We decided to stop alongside the dirt road and just sit for a while and listen. And so we found a place to pull off the road. The turnout overlooked a large field, a couple of small bluffs, and below that, a heavily forested area runs alongside a small creek. We were laughing, talking, and passing around the aforementioned devices. So, eventually, the night vision device was passed over to me. I had just recently acquired this device and was largely unfamiliar with it, except for the basics of operation. I scanned out over the field and the creek bed and noticed nothing. I was about to hand it over, but decided to look around one more time. 
I scanned across the creek bottom and into the field and noticed a black blob fairly near the tree line. It was quite large and not moving, so I assumed it was a cow or something that I had missed earlier. I focused the camera a bit better and realized it was an animal, but due to the large rounded shape of it, I suspected it was a yearling calf or a small cow lying down. I began to change the light settings on my device and turned on the infrared illuminator. The second I did this, the creature stood up. It became readily apparent that this was no cow. While facing me, it stood up straight, turned to the left, and took three steps into the tree line. I was absolutely in shock and couldn't believe what I had just seen. This thing was enormous and moved more swiftly and smoothly than a big cat. It had just flowed from one position to another. I was a tennis coach earlier in life and have been around many athletes. It takes incredible strength to move smoothly, and this thing moved unlike anything I have ever witnessed, tame or wild. I tried to hit the record button on my device, but instead I accidentally turned it off. When I managed to turn the device back on, after a lot of cursing and much wrestling with seatbelts, door handles, etc., the creature had vanished. I tried to explain exactly what I had just witnessed, but of course, since I had the only night vision scope, no one else in the car had seen it. After we all settled down a bit, we all slowly inched out of our truck wearily to investigate the area. This was not our land and trespassing can be very dangerous around here, so we were not able to search for tracks. We heard several strange owl-type sounds, but decided to call it a night. I wrestled for several days with what I had seen and decided to report it to the BFRO, so they came out and did a recreation of the encounter. I would like to share a few other much shorter experiences and reports from friends and acquaintances in that area. I had two other significant experiences on my ranch that I would like to begin with. Last July, there was a pattern in this county. I had some friends over to watch movies late one night. We were all laughing and having a good time when one of their kids jumped up from the couch. He screamed that he had seen someone or something walking by my back window. My back window faces the ranch and is completely uninhabited for miles. Since I lived so far out of town, this did not seem like it was even a possibility, so I just figured it was his imagination. It is also pretty scary out here after dark. Just to satisfy him, and maybe all of us as well, we went out into the pasture to investigate. It was perfectly still, hot, and pitch black for miles in all directions. We shined the flashlight all around and, of course, saw nothing. However, we did encounter a strange smell that none of us were familiar with. It smelled kind of like a dead skunk, but not exactly. We quickly gave up on the search due to a lack of interest, skepticism, and the mosquitoes. The next day, I let my dogs out to run around, and I walked back behind the house. I walked up on three distinct human-like tracks which measured about 16 inches long and 8 inches wide. The animal had literally walked within 25 feet of my house. Its trackway was visible and led directly to the creek right behind my house. To say the least, I was surprised since I had no idea anything like that was living in my yard. A good friend of mine also saw what he described as an 8-foot-tall, hairy-looking man while raccoon hunting out on my place, he said he never told anyone about the incident, but he claimed that he came within about 50 yards of the creature. He said he had heard a huge tree fall and pointed his flashlight toward the noise. When his lights hit the creature, he said it was squatted down by the creek, but immediately stood up and took a couple of steps into the thick brush. He said it sounded like a freight train going through the dense underbrush. He shared two other stories with me. He said in the early 90s, he built a custom hog trap that measured about 7 feet by 6 feet wide. He said he had it placed on the aforementioned creek bed. After the initial setting, 
he returned to find it torn into four different pieces with the huge metal door thrown over a hundred feet away from the trap. He said the trap was several hundred pounds and was made from extremely thick steel wire and angle iron. He said what was done to it could not have been done by five or more men working together with equipment. The second story involved the actual baiting and building of another trap similar to the one I just mentioned. He said he and his friend were finishing building a trap and baiting it after dark, and were both inside the trap when something came up behind them. Apparently, it hit the door so hard that it slammed shut and knocked the trap completely over with them still inside of it. They never saw the creature, but said it sounded like a train as it fled the scene. It took them over an hour to get out due to the damage that the trap had sustained. Several people around town tell stories of strange wood knocks, teepee-like structures, and large rocks being thrown at them near Bryson Lake. All of this has occurred within two miles of my house. I never would have imagined that these things could be this close to home, but in my quieter moments out here, I realize it is entirely feasible that something could be hiding just behind the brush. On to the next one. In Grays Harbor County, Washington, as I was driving alone in my car, I saw a very large, dingy, white, furry individual cross the road approximately 50 yards in front of my car. He did not appear to notice my car as he did not turn or glance in my direction. This creature took very wide strides and crossed the road quickly, although he did not appear to be in a hurry. The creature looked very tall and large to me. I looked around for some way to compare his height and discovered that I could not see his head above a curving road warning sign. This struck me because the creature was at least five to ten yards the other side of the sign from me, and I could see his head and shoulders above the sign. He walked upright, but slightly hunched at the shoulders and knees slightly bent. His arms and hands hung down, palms to the back. His arms did not swing much as he strode across the highway. I did not see his face because he did not turn toward me, so I don't know if he had a hairy face or not. His head and shoulders and whole body was covered with matted, whitish long hair. The shoulders didn't seem proportioned to the rest of the body. They looked more narrow, and the head was not proportionately large either. I saw no shape that would indicate breath. The hips, waist, and thighs seemed bulky and large proportionately. To my knowledge, I was the only witness. I was on my way to meet my family to camp at Kalalak for the holiday. I had had to work and my husband and children went ahead to get a good camp set up. I had traveled about five hours or more from our home in eastern Washington. Our family and friends have camped at Kalalak several times every summer for 18 years, and I was looking forward to spending the week with them. We had not come the year before because of building a new home. I was driving along with the music on loud and thinking about what condition I would find camp after Dad and the boys having set up without me. I was also thinking of how beautiful the surrounding mountains and the forest were with the rain glistening. The creature took me by surprise, and it may have been halfway across the road before I realized what I was seeing. The weather had been very wet all day, and everything was soaking wet, including the road. But it was not raining at this time, and the sun was shining brightly with broken clouds in the sky. Visibility was good for a long distance in every direction. Everything was sparkling with the rain on it. The roads were not well traveled. There was very little traffic. An empty piggyback logging truck may have been 150 yards in front of me. 
that went around the bend in the road just as I saw the creature cross between my car and the truck. I saw no other traffic for miles but an occasional camper or truck. Landscape on the east side of the highway was very dense, thick, young forest. The trees were maybe twenty feet tall or more. The underbrush was very thick and lush, as in the rain-forested area. The creature came out of this area and crossed straight over the highway to the west side, where he walked down an old abandoned logging road. There were tall trees and thick forest all around. The abandoned road had no trees, but was overgrown with thick, wet brush. I was very excited when I realized what this creature might be. Then my next reaction was one of fear because of its size and shape. Although he did not look particularly aggressive or threatening, I wanted to stop and observe where he had disappeared into the woods, but I couldn't do it. Instead, I locked my doors and slowed to a crawl in a pull-out area right where he had crossed that road. I made a mental note of where I was exactly and how high the sign was that I had compared him to. I wanted to be able to show my husband. I didn't bring the car to a complete stop, but I did observe as best as I could the surrounding. Later that week, when I was on the way home, I measured that it had been exactly one mile north of the Moclip turnoff. The most unusual thing to me was the color of the creature. I was surprised it was white, well, dirty white anyway, like the color of a white dog with matted, dirty hair. I had never heard of a white Sasquatch in Washington before. On to the next one. This was near Trenaway in Kittitas County in Washington. Just as dawn was breaking, my two-year-old son, who refused to sleep in the tent, which is why I was sitting by the fire, we were cuddling by the campfire. My son, two years old, freaked out every time we attempted to sleep in the tent. I resorted to just stay awake. I heard a low, hollow, bone-chilling scream. It was a sound I could only classify as a Bigfoot. It had lung capacity. It was also high-pitched as well as very deep. And it was intentional. Because the cry started, went on for a minute or so, it seemed like forever, and abruptly stopped. Then a small pause. Then the exact same cry again. Beginning length of noise and an abrupt silence. There were three of us all together. My son asked me what it was, and I couldn't tell him. I finally said, I think it's a Bigfoot. We were the early campers who had arrived on Wednesday. Most of the other vacationers wouldn't be out until Friday. My theory is that the Bigfoot was headed down to the water for his or her morning bath or a drink and saw all of the tents and vehicles and yelled back to whoever, the freaking campers are here, as a warning. The sound we heard was indescribable, guttural, hollow, high-pitched, and intentional. It was a bellow that carried over the valley, and it was scary. And when it was just cut off at the end, the sound didn't die out. It was loud, and then it was over. The whole camping ground neighbors were getting pissed off. They wanted to sleep. The site was before the road forked into dirt road at the free camping ground. It's all Boise Cascade Timberland, right next to a river. The river has its far bank side touching a kind of canyon wall. The campsite is between the river and the paved road. On the other side of the road, it starts out a little higher than the road and goes right into the forest and hill. There are horse trails there, and sometimes the farmer's cattle roam free there. I haven't been across the road, and I'm scared to go now. Within a mile or two, there is the Wenatchee National Forest sign. On to the next one. The following 
are Wildman accounts from the turn of the century that remarkably share similarities to modern-day Bigfoot accounts. Forks of Willamette Lane County, May 25, 1857. A most wonderful and thrilling adventure has recently occurred in the southern part of this county. A few weeks since, it appears, a man and a boy started in a quest of some lost cattle, and they had traveled a considerable distance from home. When night overtook them far away from any human habitation, and building a fire, they lay down to sleep beneath the spreading branches of a stately fir tree. Towards midnight, the boy was awakened by a loud, plaintive cry that appeared to emanate from a human being in distress not far distant from the spot where he reclined. Bringing to his feet, and without disturbing his companion, he approached the spot from whence proceeded this, to him, singularly forlorn outcry. He had not advanced many steps, however, when he observed an object approaching him that appeared like a man about twelve or fifteen feet high, of athletic proportions, with glaring eyes, which had the appearance of liquid balls of fire. The monster drew near to the boy, who was unable from fright to move a single step, and, seizing him by the arm, dragged him forcibly away toward the mountain. Over logs, underbrush, swamps, rivers, and land, with a velocity that seemed to our hero like flying. They had traveled in this manner perhaps an hour and a quarter when the monster sunk upon the earth apparently exhausted. Our hero then became aware that this creature was indeed a wild man, whose body was completely covered with shaggy brown hair about four inches in length. Some of his teeth protruded from his mouth like tusks. His hands were armed with formidable claws instead of fingers, but his feet, singular to relate, appeared natural, being clothed with moccasins similar to those worn by Indians. Our hero had scarcely made these observations when the wild man suddenly started onward as before, never for a moment relaxing his grip on the boy's arm, which had now become painful indeed. They had not proceeded far before they entered an almost impenetrable thicket of log and undergrowth when the wild man stopped, reclined upon a log, and gave one shriek, terrific and prolonged, the reverberations of which seemed to continue for the space of five minutes, immediately after which the earth opened at their feet as if a trap door ingeniously contrived had been raised. Entering at once this subterranean abode by a ladder rudely constructed of hazel brush, they proceeded downward, perhaps a hundred and fifty to two hundred feet, when they reached the bottom of a vast cave, which was brilliantly illuminated with a peculiar phosphorescent light, and water trickled from the sides of the cave in minute jet, the appearance of which was indeed singular. Above, the cave seemed slightly arched, the ceiling apparently composed of seashells of every conceivable shape and color. The bottom was, or appeared to be, thickly strewn with bones of many kinds of animals, the sight of which impressed our hero with a fearful presentiment of his own impending fate. As our hero thus closely observed the interior of this awful cave, the wild man left him as if instinctively called away before partaking of his midnight repast of roasted boy. Presently, the huge monster returned by a side door, leading gently by the hand a young and delicate female of almost miraculous grace and beauty, who had doubtless been immured in this dreadful dungeon for years. As they approached our hero, the young lady fell upon her knees, and, in some unknown language, in plaintive accent, seemed to plead for the privilege to remain forever in the cave of the wild man. This singular conduct caused our hero to imagine that the wild man, conscience-stricken, had resolved to set at liberty his lovely victim by placing her in charge of our hero, whom he evidently captured for that purpose. 
As this thought passed through the mind of our hero, his ears were greeted with the strains of the most unearthly music which came from the innermost recesses of the cave. The wild man wept piteously as he listened to the sweet voice of the charmer commingling with the wild music, and, sobbing like a child, he raised her very carefully from her recumbent posture and led her gently away as they had come. A moment afterward, the damsel returned alone and, advancing towards our hero with a ladylike modesty and grace, placed in his hand a beautifully embossed card upon which appeared the following word, traced in the most exquisite hand, evidently the lady's own. Boy, depart hence forthwith, or remain and be devoured. Our hero looked up, but the lady had vanished. However, he acted at once upon the hint implied by these words, and commenced retracing his steps towards the ladder of hazel brush, which he shortly reached and commenced the ascent. Upon arriving at the top, his horror may be imagined when he found the aperture closed. The cold sweat stood on his brow. His frame quivered with mental agony when, after a moment, he bethought himself of a small barlow knife, a present from a near relative he carried in his pocket, with which he instantly commenced picking the earth, being careful not to cut too near the spot where the ladder was made fast for fear of precipitating himself to the bottom of the cave. After laboring in this manner a short time, he was rejoiced to see daylight through the earth, and he was not much longer in working a hole large enough through which he was enabled to crawl. Then, having refreshed himself at a clear running brook close by, he wandered, he knew not whither. It was midday when he made his escape from the cave, and he traveled that day and night, and the following day, until about half past four o'clock p.m., when he encountered a small party of miners prospecting for gold on the headwaters of southern Umqua River, to whom he told the story of his adventure. They listened in silence, evidently disbelieving every word, but as they could not otherwise account for the presence of our hero in that desolate region, they all said nothing, but gave him to eat and to drink. Our hero reached the house of his father in due time. He related his adventures. The neighbor called in. He told the same story. The circuit preacher called. The story was the same. At first they smiled, then doubted, then believed. And the whole neighborhood are now prepared to make affidavit to the principal fact. The boy is a mild, modest, moral boy, about thirteen years of age, a fair complexion, and has always borne a character for truthfulness. His parents are moral and religious people, and it is hoped that out of respect to their feelings, the story will not be disbelieved as a general thing, although many parts of it are truly wonderful. A wild woman was chasing the children at Beaver Creek Schoolhouse on Wednesday, says Oregon City Courier. Her long hair is disheveled, and a few rags cover her nakedness. The children relate that they have seen her lying down by a log asleep. Several men went out immediately to hunt for her in the woods, but could find no trace of her whereabout. No human being of the feminine gender is missing from the neighborhood, and where she comes from is a mystery. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much and until next time, bye!